Welcome to The Gaze. I'm glad to be with you on a digital platform of New Europe, platform where we will show all the significant events in different regions that at the end of the day affect the world globally. And we will speak about it with our experts for you. I'm Ksenia Smirnova and it's my show Talk for more details. And I'm glad to present my today guest, it's uh, Kaima Kusk, the Estonian ambassador to Ukraine. I'm very, very glad to meet you here in our studio. Hello, thank you for inviting. Thank you for your time. And I would like to start with the, mm, my first question, let's say. At the end of February, Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Alexei Rezikov, stated that the total amount of aid to Ukraine from Estonia has already exceeded 1% GDP of the Baltic country. And according to Kiev University, your country has already contributed more than 1.25% of its GDP and is the leader among the all countries of the world. You have already repeatedly explained why it's so, but I will have more I would say a modest question to you. For how long will Estonia be able to maintain such a number for our people? Until the Ukrainian victory, for sure. And then beyond that as well, actually. So uh, we, we uh, support you because it's an existential fight for us as well. So we have an unprecedented uh, high military budget. Uh, and we will rise it uh, as well. So we acquire new things, and part of the new things we are ready to deliver to you. So you can, if you are so um, sure in what you say, so you maybe might predict for how long will may it last in time, the war, I mean, because we see that the Putin has no intentions to stop. Yeah, but uh, Any you, predictions? you will win. You will win for sure. It's uh, not possible to give the dates. Uh, well, then you are taking this video uh, out. Uh, you are looking what I said, and then uh, I could be too optimistic or a little bit uh, too pessimistic. So I will not uh, give the date, uh, but the win will will come. Okay, then let's get a little bit more details uh, about your help, the help of your country. At the end of uh, 2022, uh, the Estonian government decided to provide another package of military aid to Ukraine, which included drones, personal uh, protective equipments and winter uniforms. Estonian Defense Minister Hanno Pevkur said uh, in particular Estonia transferred body armor, uh, ballistic plates for the body armor, uh, field uniforms, including winter and other clothing and and, uh, accessories. So can you tell us whether the AIDS packages are currently being prepared, the new ones, and uh, what exactly might or will it contain? Uh, we are working. Uh, 45th aid package has been completed uh, and we have started to work with the 46th uh, aid package. Uh, and uh, the, the the most significant thing uh, I can mention at the moment is the next field hospital. The modern, we, I, I can call it the most modern field hospital in the world, actually. It's a mobile. It will be possible to pack it in one hour, unpack it in uh, also one hour. Uh, we have already de delivered three of those field hospitals. Two first ones with Germans and the third one with the Netherlands and Norway. And this fourth one we will bring with Iceland. So can you imagine? Iceland, small uh, country, but we do it in cooperation. Your uh, uh, military medical uh, officers love it. They call it uh, our space rocket, because it's really a modern one and it saves lives. So uh, that will be, uh, let's say, uh, one of the most significant things we are delivering quite soon. Uh, what the specifics of this hospital? How ma many people can it accept uh, at once at the same time? It's you said it's mobile, so uh, it's very fast. It can move uh, along the uh, borderline of the fire, fire, fire uh, hot points of. Uh, uh, absolutely, because it's loaded on the trucks. Mm -hmm. It's uh, inside containers, and the containers consist of uh, the best medical equipment you can have. So. Uh, it depends of the modules, but up to 50, 60 persons at the same time mm -hmm. you can treat. Uh, and the, the idea is not to, to heal them, but to stabilize them there. That, uh, to, to come as close as possible to the front line 
where you have this so-called golden hour to, to save uh, lives yeah, of sure. the soldiers. Yeah, it's, it's the, the, the most uh, um, important period of time and because of uh, all the time shootings around, uh, uh, we are losing time to move uh, the person, the soldier, to the safety, safe place and uh, to um, provide him with assistance. And um, it's interesting for me uh, how we, who is... Uh, uh, whose initiative is in uh, uh, providing the list of all the necessities for the France, uh, I mean, all this military aid. Is this your initiative and how you understand what we need and what time? Or this is the Ukrainian side that provides you the list and you, according to your abilities? Um... No, it's, it's in a very, very close cooperation. There's a different format. Uh, Rammstein format is one where the ministers of defense are gathering. But during every visit uh, what we have, and we have quite a significant amount of visits coming to Ukraine, it's not just traveling, it's uh, meeting with your high officials. And uh, I like how uh, pragmatic and concrete uh, you Ukrainians are. Meeting with Zelensky, our president, uh, you know exactly uh, what we have and what uh, you want, actually. So uh, I have told to... to our politicians, sometimes they like to say that we have given everything. And the sentence is that to show that we have given really a lot. But it's not true. We have things to give. Uh, we are getting more. So, and you, you know, uh, Ukrainians know it very well. You have, we know you have uh, those kind of uh, infantry fighting vehicles. We know the exact numbers. Give some to us. So uh, I, I like this very concrete, pragmatic approach uh, you have. So, you know, I think that uh, this was kind of illusion about the second uh, army in the world so, of Russia and until the full-scale invasion. But maybe uh, this is an illusion that uh, some very important and uh, famous uh, intelligence services in the world are top number one. Maybe a Ukrainian intelligence service in this case are much, much more pro professional. You are very good. Because we know all about what we, you have. Yeah, well, between the friends, uh, well, we are not uh, keeping keeping loose uh, secrets, but your services are absolutely good against uh, arch enemy as well, actually. I have cooperated with them and I can compliment uh, them, actually. Let's um, think um, about what else can be very important uh, right now and not only in the battlefield just to help uh, even uh, the agricultural sector because a lot of our uh, fields are uh, undermined. M uh, mines and uh, it needs, uh, as experts said, a huge amount of years to undermine it all. And um, you, your country, Estonia, at the end of 2022, reported uh, that has sent to Ukraine equipment for demining ammunition left by Russian troops uh, in the deoccupied territories worth than uh, 330,000 euros. But I would also like to ask you about uh, the help in reconstruction. And first, as I mentioned before, uh, what uh, kind of ammunition for demining uh, you can really uh, provide us because I know that we need uh, even some more uh, highly uh, technological uh, drones or so-called uh, um, ammunitions that can uh, eliminate these uh, uh, mines from the sky because doing it on the ground it takes uh, much longer but much more time so what is this and um, and we help you as much as we can and even more. We bring the equipment, uh, what we even haven't uh, tested yet, actually. Sometimes we test it with uh, your guys, because that's the, that's the need here, actually. So, uh, of course, in summertime, when you are trying to demine the field, uh, the grass is so high, like, I don't know, uh, the guy himself. So it's not easy to detect, so you can use the drones to detect uh, maybe some of the mines. There's some even out-of-the-box ideas how to uh, use those uh, mechanical robot uh, lawn movers, you know, to, mm -hmm. to take the grass away and if yeah. the robot lawn movers then hit the mine, okay, let it hit, actually. It's just a uh, robot, actually. So. So they are very creative. Uh, your Ukrainian guys plus Estonians as well, actually, or uh, Norwegians are doing. So, uh, so yeah, we, 
we bring you the classical equipment, but also we try to do some out of the box thinking, how to be creative, how to speed it up, although it will take years, it will take decades. Uh, we still uh, find uh, old mines or, or, or bombs from the Second World War in Estonia, actually, and, and dealing with them. That's the mining. The second thing is reconstruction, because uh, people uh, are living. Uh, as I'm saying, life will catch you, even uh, during the war time. So you need to give people services uh, in cities where they are. Uh, so we have uh, been in close contact uh, with Shotam Oblast, which is our focus oblast in reconstruction. We uh, built a new kindergarten there with a shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so the mothers uh, can put their kids safely in a kindergarten and go to work while their husbands are on the front line. Uh, and it took us less than, than a year. So uh, it's a beautiful one. It's uh, very modern. It has uh, sun batteries on, on a roof, so it produces its own electricity. But uh, most important, the safety. And, uh, and uh, coziness, uh, what it has. And the second object we will finalize soon, together with the Ukrainians, is a bridge in Malin, which got uh, bombed by the Russians. And it will be completed in se September, I think, uh, roughly. And it's the first time for us to do something together in a way that we will finance half. Mm and the Ukrainian uh, side is financing the uh, other half, actually. So, uh, so we like this ownership, uh, see the ownership uh, feeling as well, that uh, it's not just, uh, hey, we need help. No, 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 we are cooperating with you, and uh, you are doing uh, greatly. But, but it's like uh, an investment, or it's uh, like a... It's aid. Don't, don't it's aid, it's aid, aid. yeah, because mm. uh, it will help uh, this city. We will uh, renovate it. They know that it was Estonia. Well, that's a mutual love. The question of reconstruction is very difficult, especially now, because we understand uh, we started our conversation from we don't know, we cannot predict when the war ends. And uh, um, time after time, uh, the Kremlin uh, uh, is bombing the um, civilian infrastructure, even in the deoccupied cities, like it happens with Kherson, for example. So how can you be sure that so all the places that uh, you are planning to reconstruct will be safe and preserved? And so the other question, it should be uh, the uh, temporary buildings, or you can be assured that this territory um, can be preserved, maybe from sky with the uh, PVO, uh, all these constructions, air yes, air defense. And so afterwards, uh, and another question uh, in, in this uh, um, area, in this field, uh, we have to reconstruct from the very beginning just to, to um, renew all that was before, or we have to think uh, on the modern um, projects and on the modern um, necessities of this region and just to, to, to start something new. H how you see this process? Well, you, you can't be sure. During the war time, you are taking risks, as your people are living there, taking risks, they're not leaving the uh, country. So we take the risk as well, actually. So, as I said, uh, your people need services. Um, definitely, it should be modern. It, there's no uh, well need to renovate a 60 year old uh, public building which don't have any architectural uh, value, actually. And even communi communications no, inside no, are no, very no, old no. and. Uh, well, take. Take the modern uh, architecture, the, the, the projects, etc. Your, your side, uh, Kobrakov, uh, Minister, of, Minister of Infrastructure, yeah. turned to us and said that, hey, we can understand that you don't, you don't have resources to rebuild uh, or, or build new schools, uh, all the schools which are needed. Please give us the most modern project you have, actually. So we have recently built in Estonia some uh, marvelous new school buildings, actually, for secondary schools. So, okay, we can, we can basically deliver those projects and we will have a beautiful copy of one Estonian school in, oh. somewhere in Ukraine. 
Uh, one more question about yeah. this. We were thinking about how to move this project. Uh, and first, we called it some like uh, brother cities and uh, that will help. We'll choose uh, some region, some city, each country will rebuild each uh, uh, territory that it, it uh, chooses. So in this situation, since one year passed, uh, how it happens, how you choose? Or it's initiative again of Mr. Kubrakov, or maybe uh, they, they, uh, all the governments of Ukraine. How it happened? Uh, Zelensky called, let uh, hey countries, uh, foreign countries, please come take one oblast and focus on uh, one oblast. So uh, we heard it, and then we were actually reached by several different oblasts. Zhotomer was one of them. So we decided where to go. And uh, we had uh, communication with those different uh, sides. We knew Zhotomir also beforehand. We knew the Oblast uh, government. So we, we knew about their values as well and how they are able to work. Uh, they immediately, they were very proactive and I, we, we liked it as well, actually. You see the initiative, that means something can come out of that. So they came with 15 objects saying that uh, pick some from there. So I traveled through all those objects. Mm -hmm. I think very good was also that we were frank to each other, honest. So I said that we will not uh, rebuild this bridge because you don't need it. Because it was built before Chernobyl catas catastrophe. It uh, connects the Zhotomer Oblast with uh, Kiev Oblast in the north. There is no such traffic anymore. You don't need such a bridge. So I was very frank with them. We don't pick that one. But we will pick another object uh, and you tell us if you don't want it or you don't like it. Because we don't have the feeling that, oh, well, the aid is coming. Let's, they, they, yeah, found some, something old, so they, they found something old from the shelves. Uh, they don't need it anymore, but they are giving it to us and we have to do, uh, take it because it's the aid. No, no, no. I said, come to Estonia, look the kindergarten. Our kids going to the same kindergarten because we, we are very proud of this kindergarten. So they uh, saw that really the kindergarten is modern. Really Estonian kids are going there. They are very happy there. Then the Ukrainians, the oblast said, let uh, make tenders in Estonia. So no, no one can even start the rumors that mm -hmm. uh, something is wrong with uh, money. So, uh, so everything uh, went. So I, I liked uh, also how Zhatomir Oblast uh, worked on their side, so uh, we, we had to match the standards, it's the EU standards, Ukrainian standards. Your standards are even tougher than EU ones actually, so we needed to adjust uh, those ones. So it's interesting, it was an interesting process. So it's easier to work on the regional level as I understand, and it's time to be pragmatic in this situation and uh, really attentive to the amount of money that's coming into the country. We, we and to are, control everything. No, right? We work in both sides. In the in government level, the military aid goes uh, mainly from the Minister, I mean, Minister of Defense. I mean, in the field of reconstruction, it's easy to understand each other when you are in a, this territory and you see that all you, 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 you said that you traveled around and you saw what we need, what we don't need. So it's easier no, to work on this level? No, well, I, I will not even say that it's easier. We have a very positive uh, experience now working in uh, local level and it's the part we can call it decentralization. Yeah. Your oblasts are functioning. But central government is functioning as well, actually. So we just picked uh, that one. Our resources are scarce. You said these uh, friendly towns. Uh, yeah. You know our scale, our biggest town is, uh, is Tallinn, the capital. Well, it's the same size as Vinitsa. So it's, uh, well, the second biggest, uh, it's Tartu, it's like Ushkorod. But then all the rest, we are proud that we have a mighty, yeah. mighty towns. In your scale, it's almost like village. So uh, our friendly towns are not able to build your uh, friendly towns. So we need to come in the whole country. I'm detailed in these um, um, questions because uh, it uh, can be uh, used as an example for other countries that are listening to our interview and uh, to understand them how to communicate uh, that it would be uh, very uh, effective, fast 
and under control. Absolutely, well. we are result oriented. <laughs> uh, you as well. Uh, in the wartime, you can't uh, do differently. So. Uh, the results are here. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about uh, your uh, military aid, uh, because it's like an example for other countries too. I will undermine that in January you stated that Estonia handed over all its 155mm uh, howitzers. Uh, howitzers, but it's howitzers. Daud howitzers. Daud lots howitzers. Of, lots, not uh, the self-propelled, which are moving themselves, so we have some for ourselves also yeah. to be ready when the uh -huh. madmen decide to come. Yeah, <clears throat> okay. So you gave it to Ukraine and so you explained it this way, so that other states do not have any excuses why they cannot provide Ukraine with the necessary weapons. So do you think it worked already or mm, there have to be m much more informational work? Uh, it worked. I think it worked very well. Uh, you never uh, are able to do it alone, so there were some other countries also that made l those kind of steps, uh, so to say, took uh, some risk, giving away some capabilities to almost to zero. Uh, to take away the argument that, hey, we, we, we can't, we have to keep it. No, you, you don't need to keep it. See, we, we did it. So uh, after that came the tank coalition, it's definitely ins well, got some inspiration from our move. Uh, ammunition part, actually, as well. Uh, more and more ammunition has been given, although the production have only started now. So we will be in, uh, at the end of the year in a better situation in Ukraine as well. And I'm pretty sure that uh, fighter planes will come as well. And it's definitely... The, the, the stone started to roll, uh, actually. Mm -hmm. You inspire the others and the things starting to happen. It's because you are on the border close to uh, Ukraine and on the borders with Russia. I remember I heard one of the interview uh, by, uh, with the, the uh, member of parliament of Germany and the journalist on Deutsche Welle asked uh, about leopards. It's be before they uh, decided to give us leopards. And she asked, uh, why don't you do it? And he said, uh, because we need them to ourselves. We have to count how much we can provide. And she asked him, are you preparing to um, continue war on our territory? That's why you are doubting in this decision. So these uh, uh, arguments are still um, on time? Well, in case of uh, understanding uh, what I've uh, learned here, uh, and very much I think is that uh, that understanding is not possible without experience, at least full understanding. So that uh, unites us. So we have been under Russian occupation. We know how cruel they are. In the West, they quite often mirroring their own habits, their own culture, their own rules of engagement of the military. They think that uh, this adversary, 21st century, should be civilized as well, use the minimum uh, force. No, it's not the case. We know, you knew, uh, yeah. know it as well from Holodomor, that peace can be more deadly under Russian occupation than the exact fighting. So we need to explain it, but explaining is not enough. We need to bring them here, sit under the air alarm when the air defense is working, show the Borodyanka, it's working. Our Parliament Defence Committee uh, was here three weeks ago. There was a full general, retired, uh, and another general as well, and they looked at Borodyanka buildings, which are just cut in the half, and they said, Look, it's crazy. Without uh, being at the place, you don't have the understanding, full understanding. Uh, What's, what it is to repel the Russian um, Empire uh, attacking you. So being here, I think the German delegations have been here as well, sitting uh, on the air yeah. raid, hour and a half, Steinmeier was there, talking with locals who have lost someone, it has impact. And that, uh, when you ask from your 
advisor land that hey, we are sitting here already hour and a half. Could we do something uh, to limit uh, at least the time? Yeah, we can do. We can bring some more Irish tea. Then you have this inner feeling that okay, let's bring. <laughs> so, so you are not substituting uh, actually uh, experience with uh, nothing. It's uh, when you bring people here and show them, but uh, when you uh, um, come uh, to the tribune in the European Parliament and say what you saw in Ukraine, it, does it work or not? Because I remember not long ago the words of uh, the president of uh, European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, that said from the tribune in the European Union that uh, we, they, I mean, they uh, didn't hear the loud voice of the Baltic countries, and Estonia especially, you were very loud for Ukraine, for the safety of the region, and she said, we didn't hear them then, in 2014, and all of these years, but now, uh, it, it really situation changed or not? Do they hear your well, voice? Well, we continue to be loud. Uh, we call everybody to tune to our radio channel, uh, <laughs> Estonian one. So uh, uh, every state has its own political interests. Uh, although I'm the one who believes in cooperation and uh, values as well, actually. The free world, uh, the rule-based world, uh, should stand against authoritarian ones, actually. So uh, we continue to be very loud. Not always it's easy, but, uh, well, it shouldn't be. Let's talk about the people who are still continue to be loud uh, inside uh, the European countries. I mean, those people who, in one way or another, support Putin. There are some groups of such people in every country, let's be honest. So uh, you have an experience in intelligence services, so intelligent, intelligence work. I want to ask you, and before I want to add some more information, you, you are, as a person, worked for 21 years in Estonia Foreign Intelligence Service, right? Right. Uh, and you, uh, your course work was devoted to Russian geopolitics. In your opinion, why are the warnings that Estonia spreads in the United uh, European Union so difficult for European politi politicians to accept? I mean, uh, from the point of view of intelligence services, not pragmatic politicians, but the people who really know what you have, like you said about our government, what you have, what your intentions, and what you are preparing to do. Because you uh, have concentrated your work on different threats. And then you think that uh, this mutual dependency will help to avoid uh, conflicts and war. That's the, the concept, actually, that uh, if we buy your gas and you get our money, the, the, the belief in, in the West that uh, you need our money more than we need your gas was a little bit self-fooled uh, ourselves. Uh, so uh, that was a mistake. So, uh, so well, I have to continue to, to work, to show, to bring the information, convince uh, others. I think uh, this, this uh, Western kind of uh, market economy where you are thinking that everything can be achieved through win-win uh, deals, it's not functioning in some culture room. There's, in, in case of Russia, there's no win-win thing. If uh, you are winning, they feel that they are losing. So uh, it's not in their mindset, never have been. And it's not, it's, it's the em, 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 imperialistic mindset. Uh, they are bearing and still it's in Scotland. But um, I don't think that the question is only in uh, gas or oil. In this situation, we understand that uh, lots of lobby in uh, the politicum of uh, different uh, European countries, of Russia, in businesses, and a lot of bots, real estate uh, in the top capitals of the Western countries. So uh, hidden money, like we now understand, uh, are in uh, 
almost each country of European Union. And so the, the, the uh, European Commission and European Parliament are trying to somehow to um, find this money and to frozen these accounts uh, of uh, Russian oligarchs and to do something with this. But it's a long-term story. But is situation changing really? And uh, you can see and you can observe that it's changing. Do you see it? Uh, definitely changing, because the war have came so close to all of us in Europe. It's in the EU, in Europe, actually. So it's, uh, it's uh, easy to close your eyes when it's somewhere far away and you think that it's just an exception. And it, it's not so clear. No, it's very clear. There's an aggressor and there's a victim, actually. Um, so, of course, it's, uh, it's nice to, to believe that uh, bringing uh, Keats of uh, authoritarian leaders to Western universities will uh, change their uh, minds. Uh, well, well, Assad studied in uh, Switzerland. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, head of the North Korea as well. No, it's not functioning like that. It's not. Uh, it's not working. So uh, we have made some mistake being too naive. Well have to learn from those mistakes. I just thought about it, but just this very moment. Uh, can be the country preserved from Russian aggression or invasion if there are lots of Russian big money? Because we understand when people um, put money in one of the countries, uh, it may everything to preserve their earnings, right? So in this situation of this aggression to Ukraine and the position of Putin, towards European countries as well, as we can hear from the propagandist channel each day from Russia. Are these countries preserved by this big money inside the country? No, no, no. no. Uh, as I already said, mutual dependence uh, is not uh, uh, working if uh, other sides' uh, values are totally different, completely different then it's not working. It's working inside the European Union, and we are proud of that. Uh, but we share the values. Current France, current Germany, sharing the values. That's, that's why the mutual dependence works. Not between uh, totally different uh, cultures. It's, it's not functioning. So uh, I remember when we sat in Lviv, uh, uh, in the beginning of uh, large-scale war. We, I was here in Kiev, uh, but on the second day of the large-scale war, we moved mm -hmm. with part of the team, part stayed in Kiev. We moved to Lviv, and we sat there with uh, some other European diplomats. And one of them was very happy that we are sitting in the city center of Lviv. It's under UNESCO protection, and that's why we are protected. Mm -hmm. Because Russia, as a member of the United Nations, will not hit city center, old, beautiful Lviv, which is under UNESCO protection. And then Joseph Biden traveled to Poland, and <laughs> we saw some and different situations. Right? It started, and, uh, but I explained there at the place uh, how Russian occupiers uh, looked at the cultural heritage uh, in Estonia, be it uh, Nord, uh, this, uh, Baltic German noblemen houses or cemeteries. They built a pig farm on Baltic German noblemen's cemetery. So they don't respect any cultural heritage. The Western diplomat was, was sad about that because uh, I, I ruined the mood. Uh, he was trying to be optimistic, but uh, it's only force what uh, what uh, actually works against yeah. this empire. We can uh, even observe what they did together with Assad, with Aleppo, and other ancient cities in Syria, actually, with bombing. True. Yeah. And this was under protection of UNESCO, too, as I can guess, right? But anyways, let's talk a little about uh, the uh, migration situation uh, in Europe, in Western Europe, in your country. And um, in this field, I want to uh, touch the very um, important and uh, very uh, difficult question, uh, as a so-called soft power that Russia uses, uh, 
using people inside the country to destabilize, to destabilize somehow the situation. So some more additional information. According to the Estonian security police, from the end of February to the end of uh, 2022, 44, 45,000 uh, Ukrainian refugees applied for protection in Estonia. Conversations with refugees clearly show that the active uh, of activity of the FSB against Ukrainians so the territory of Russia and in the occupied territories, the annual report says. According to the security police department, they were approached by both refugees and residents of Estonia, and it helped to see the scope of Russian intelligence activities aimed at Estonia since the beginning of the war. For example, the FSB began systematically interviewing people who regularly visit Russia for work. While crossing the border, they are asked about their attitude towards Russia and the special military operation conducted against Ukraine, as well as about uh, the alleged um, persecution of Russians in Estonia. So to what extent is this problem currently re relevant for your country and what the government uh, does with this? Living and neighboring uh, aggressive uh, empire, that's a constant challenge and problem. It's not some, nothing new, actually. The Russian special services love to recruit people in their territory. So our internal security service uh, published uh, warnings also before the large-scale war that uh, be aware that if you travel there, if you have some business there, uh, you will be approached. You will be made an offers. Offers that uh, you can't refuse. Uh, so uh, please contact us. Let's uh, think something interesting together, actually, and we can we can help you, and we will help you. So uh, yeah, lots of people have uh, approached, uh, but there are always uh, someone who think that oh, it it will not happen with me. I will uh, travel, you know, go to Saint Petersburg. Uh, love the architecture, opera there, and, uh, well, later you are in trouble. So it's not something uh, new. Not all those 45,000 who applied for the protection came through Russia. Majority of them came, uh, well, directly to Poland, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and then reached out to Estonia. But those who were able to get out of Russia uh, high probability that uh, they were approached, at least uh, had a conversation. So that's uh, the f well, situation we are living with, and we have to learn how to cope with that counterintelligence cha challenge. Let's see what's going on inside your country. Uh, um, are there any fears in connection with the presence of Russians? on the territory of Estonia, and are there um, certain movements among, we call it Russian-speaking uh, Estonians, Russian-speaking groups in Estonia, since the beginning of the war in Ukraine? Even despite of uh, great development Estonia has uh, done during the last few decades, when we got our independence back, there's still some percent of the people who has this imperialistic feeling inside them. So they dream about uh, being part of the huge empire, dreaming, I don't know, about what they then uh, get there. So there's still some of them. It's not critical mass, uh, but the percentage is there. Uh, during the spring elections, a person called Ivo Orav, uh, uh, Ivo Petersen, sorry, Ivo Petersen, uh, was uh, running also on elections, got almost 4,000 uh, votes, which in Estonian scale is, well, rather solid uh, amount, but uh, didn't bring him into, into parliament. Uh, he traveled to Ukrainian occupied territories, uh, which means that he cooperated with FSB, because you can't do it uh, without that. And returning to Estonia, our internal security service uh, arrested him. So, uh, so well, the, the guy has got uh, accusation, and uh, our institutions, they are good working.
It's interesting when the people with, the, like you said, imperialistic uh, overview of the world and them in this world uh, still uh, don't leave uh, Estonia and go to Moscow or St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg <laughs> to promote this movement. They stay in uh, European countries with European passports, live in European democratic life with all this beautiful, uh, additional uh, good things uh, that can uh, uh, provide this way of life, but still be imperialistic. It's something with the mentality or what? even if they spent half of their life in a European country. It's deep-rooted, uh, and it's really, they have grown up uh, with that. Their parents probably uh, had the same attitude, probably, well, the school teachers from the Soviet time. So that's, that's really, really hard to get out uh, this imperialistic mindset, actually. It's, it's there in and they enjoy the freedom of speech. It's like the old anecdote from the Soviet time where the American and the Russian are meeting and they are talking about freedom of speech. American is saying that we have such a good freedom of speech, uh, we can go in front of the White House and say that we don't like Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. And the Russian says, oh, well, we can go to the Red Square as well and say that we don't <laughs> like Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> so. Awesome. They can't understand it, uh, that, uh, and it's, well, they are not moving back to Russia because uh, life, living standard in Estonia is so much higher. It's very comfortable to criticize uh, Estonia and dream about the Russian Empire when you don't uh, need to be vulnerable, whether you got uh, bread and sausage on the bread as well. Or the, the toilets. Or no, a toilet, or you will be mobilized to to die in. Uh, because there were stealing line. toilets from our apartments. That is uh, peculiar. I have <laughs> peculiar. talk. I have talked uh, with uh, former uh, governor of uh, Luhansk Oblast, mm -hmm. uh, Serhi Haidai, my uh, good friend, and he said that he can't understand why they are stealing the washing machines yeah. if they don't have water in their house. But anyways, every post-Soviet country has a city that the Kremlin call, uh, calls pro-Russian. In Ukraine, it's Donbas and Crimea are called that uh, name, and in Estonia, it's Narva. And is this really the case, and how do you combat such narratives if they are, um, exist still? Because before this uh, full-scale invasion, all of the countries were must, much more uh, loyal to these people. So they don't pay attention, didn't pay attention to them. The case is that uh, Moscow themselves uh, have fooled uh, themselves, actually. I mean, they have believed that everybody who speaks uh, Russian is uh, automatically uh, Moscow-minded or, or em 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 empire-minded, actually. It's absolutely not true. So uh, that's another phenomenon. Uh, in authoritarian state, when the leader believes something, the lower levels are afraid to argue that. Mm -hmm. So the officer is not going to, to the dictator and saying that, well, you are wrong. Uh, the, they, they love Estonia, they love uh, Ukraine. No, they will not argue. So they believe something totally wrong. And in our case, Narva, okay, it's uh, Russian speaking. There are lots of uh, people living there are uh, Russians, but uh, they have learned Estonian as well. And they are bordering, bordering Russia. On the other side of the border river is a city called Ivangorod. And I have uh, given an example. Uh, years ago, the European Union had a project where you can apply for uh, money. Uh, like a twin cities, not it are not twin cities actually, there's a border river, but uh, to build something uh, nice on both sides of the border, EU, where Estonia is, and uh, Russian uh, Ivangorod. So both sides got one million euro mm -hmm. to build beautiful promenades on a riverside. So for this one million, we built one kilometer of most beautiful promenade. Well, maybe a little bit too expensive, but still, one kilometer. I can guess what you will say. And in the Russian <laughs> side, it was 250 meters. The rest of the money was stolen. In the case where the, the labor is cheaper, materials are cheaper, they got four times 
less promenade for the same money. So the people in Narva actually can understand it very well, where they want to live uh, and uh, where their loyalty is. So let, if there's like three, three four thousand people who vote for this imperial-minded uh, guy on the elections, it's not a critical mass. Maybe for them, 250 meters is enough for promenade. <laughs> because they have to spend a lot of time before television. Because <laughs> don't their have time attitude for is promenade, different. actually. They <laughs> don't have this ownership uh, feeling to their country. Yeah. They think that, oh, the one who are able to steal is a... Cool guy. He's a, a cool he guy. knows how to live, yeah. actually. Yes, absolutely. And they don't <laughs> dream that... Uh, well, instead of 250 meters, we should have one kilometer. They dream how to replace the guy mm -hmm. and steal the same way. So that's the difference of different us, mm -hmm. different of Europeans, different of, uh, difference of uh, Russians. But, but still, you said that um, uh, these people, these groups of people are so little that they cannot uh, um, um, uh, influence uh, any political um, uh, decisions. I'm looking at the example of Georgia and what's going on right now in the political of Georgia. If something changes in the political of Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, whatever compact country, mm -hmm. uh, there might be changes uh, among the small group of this society because uh, Russian use them, as I said before, like a soft power. So they're starting to say, why don't have the main use in Russian? Why don't have television in Russian? Why uh, you don't uh, treat us uh, as uh, real Estonians or whatever? So do you see the risk in this? Are you preserved in your political uh, situation in the country for not uh, uh, repeating the uh, example of Georgia that we're observing right now? Uh, well, uh, Georgia should repeat our success. We are not looking how they are acting. We are a little bit vulnerable because, uh, because uh, as we understood it, uh, as we got our independence back, you can't be neutral. You can't balance on the, well, breach of the two worlds. Mm -hmm. You have to choose the side. Because uh, neutrality means grey zone, that means troubles always. So if you think that <coughs> we need to balance, <coughs> sorry, it will uh, bring you trouble anyway. So that's why we decided uh, immediately in the beginning of uh, 1991, we want to get away as quickly as possible from, from Russia. Not ge geographically, well, although we dreamed about that in the 80s that if all Estonians going to the eastern border of uh, those days occupied Estonia, and if we push, we can float away and park our country somewhere near Ireland. Mm -hmm. Well, not physically possible, actually. So, uh, so yeah, well, the serious political uh, parties whom we have, have consensus where we want to go, be, where we are, and uh, how and what kind of future we want for ourselves and our kids. So uh, we don't want to be back on the Russian Empire, sharing their culture of corruption, etc. I have uh, several um, I'd say global questions to you as a diplomat, and I want to ask you um, that uh, the work of Ukrainian diplomats and partners diplomats, so where did they fail to avoid full-scale invasion? I think diplomats did maximum. Uh, diplomacy is not working without force. If you don't have power, behind you, against aggressor, diplomacy is not uh, able to save you. So the only thing is force. But still remembering 2014, during all these long periods, our Western partners who were in uh, um, the group... Uh, Minsk? 
Minsk group? Uh, Not uh, Minsk. Uh, Norma Normandy group? Normandy, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And uh, they were insisting on the Minsk agreements and they were insisting on the diplomacy and they were not, were, were, were against uh, all the uh, military movements towards Russians in Donbass and in Crimea before the full-scale invasion, during all, almost nine years, they were the initiatives uh, of uh, diplomacy. But now... Uh, you were the part of that. So y Ukraine w was part of the decision. And we cannot say that it was totally wrong at that moment. Well, those were the circumstances. At the moment, Ukraine is a totally different country. The Ukrainian army is totally different to what it was 2014. That... Uh, agreement were reached together. Ukraine tried to solve the issue with peaceful means. Russia saw that they cannot fool you, they cannot play you, they, they cannot break you, and then decided that, uh, I mean, the Putin decided in, their, in his head that he needs Ukraine as a part of the empire and launched a full-scale war. So it's, well, looking back in the history, it's those ifs, uh, you know, it's not easy to, to say what was completely wrong. Well, but actually, you just said the very concrete words that not diplomacy can preserve your country, but the force. And therefore, I want to ask you, uh, all this prediction about Putin's intentions since 2007, his speech in Munich, uh, were the Minsk agreement a mistake? Were the mistake for not given our, the uh, uh, opportunity to uh, uh, join NATO? Were the mistake not uh, helping us uh, with the uh, military aid and service, I mean, the, the, weaponing, the, the weapon in the country before the full-scale invasion? So we lost all these nine years by the mistake of um, top politicians of European countries? Uh, I will not blame uh, fingering on uh, concrete, uh, concrete politicians. Uh, I already said that I uh, think uh, believing in mutual uh, dependency was a mistake. Believing that uh, uh, that uh, avoiding escalation, that was a mistake. That, that definitely, but I will not finger that, uh, hey, uh, that uh, the one single politician was wrong. The, the history uh, will finger. History will finger, exactly. Uh, absolutely. The, the weakness is the thing which provokes Russia. Not... Uh, military might. Being afraid that uh, weak uh, Russia can be even more dangerous, I don't buy it. Estonian uh, uh, history shows us that we have had trouble always with strong Russia. So we are absolutely interested in to, to have as weak Russia as possible. I will put my question differently a little bit. Could the West prevent war in Ukraine and tension in the region? No, because the decision was made by Russian dictator. In his head, he had a vision. As I said, no intelligence officer, no military officer came to him to say that, Mr. You are wrong. Ukrainians are strong. We will suffer huge losses. We will not take uh, Kiev in, in three, three days. US sent CIA, head of the CIA, to, to Moscow to tell them in the face that we know what you're up to. That, so don't do it. Uh, it. It will have consequences. So, ruined mindset of uh, ex-KGB officer He's, he's not believing anything, actually, uh, what uh, West is telling them, uh, or him, actually. Because he is thinking that it's uh, some cruel uh, intelligence game against him, always believing it. Uh, well. So, uh, no, the only way to avoid that could have been to step up uh, 
with the force. But let us, let us know that the, the moment is that uh, Ukraine were not a member of NATO. We didn't left you alone, and that's most important, I think, in the meaning of uh, the armament. Okay, it, it didn't come uh, from the first day in a full scale, in the full variety, but we didn't leave you alone, and that's the biggest achievement, I think. So uh, I can uh, resume that it's a mutual fault. I mean. And well, ours, no, 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 and, and Ukrainian, no. Uh, Europeans, no. <coughs> uh, Budapest Memorandum and all uh, of the agreements. Well, yeah, I could say that uh, having and a few, few nukes would be handy against uh, such a neighbor. But uh, now I remember um, an old story uh, from Finland. There's a journalist asked uh, from uh, Mannerheim uh, that uh, who was guilty? in Finland that uh, Stalin, the dictator, attacked us. And the Mannerheim looked at him and said, well, actually you answered yourself, have you thought of Stalin? Who was guilty? He was. The dictator started the war. So uh, that's, uh, we, we, we can't blame ourselves. That's, that's wrong. It's like a girl, uh, well, beautiful girl on the street, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, She's was, not guilty. was she guilty yeah, no, when she was attacked? No. Never. Absolutely. So, so now, for this very moment, a lot of illusions went to the past. Is he treated uh, still like a dictator in the world? I mean, the, the power of the dictator or maybe a uh, humiliated dictator? Because my question is, um, what are the USA and Europe most fears of Russian Federation for today? Nukes. Previously Russia, previously, Russia was called gas station with nukes. Mm. Now, uh, as we buy less and less gas and petrol from them, it's just a station with, uh, with nukes. That's, you ho always have to consider this element there, but you shouldn't be afraid. Because otherwise, well, you are giving away everything, uh, being just afraid of the nukes. So, so I think let's... That's the element which makes uh, West cautious. Afraid of using it uh, on the territory of Ukraine or on the territory of NATO countries? Because it sounds like a um, fa fa fantastic movie or something like the Hollywood blockbuster, actually. The NATO countries the large with scale, all the powerful... Large-scale war uh, against Ukraine sounded also like a fanta fantasy, actually. Even uh, November 2021, several Western European countries didn't believe that, despite the intel uh, what US and UK had. The final question is about the situation uh, on this very moment, I mean, today, when we are talking. Uh, what now rules Europe and what now rules Russia? Um, something changed in, in the um, strategy of uh, Russia and the strategy of Europe? Well, it's, uh, Russia is ruled by the imperialistic instincts. Uh, they can understand that if they are not uh, enlarging, the empire will collapse, and it will collapse. The, the bite they took here uh, in uh, Ukraine, or the bite they, they tried to took here, uh, will kill them. And uh, that, that's, that's going to happen. In case of Europe, uh, I think uh, the driving force is more and more the self-confidence that we as a Europe, through cooperation, can have impact. So this, uh, this talks about uh, that mm -hmm. we need to be able to defend ourselves. So it be, together with US, Canada, Japan, Australia, free world, that's the cooperation, so. I can't even imagine this diplomacy with Russia after the war. I mean, physically cannot imagine. No, maybe we have Moscow, yeah. uh, <laughs> some, some other regions, and we will build uh, from yes. zero the new relations some moment. We'll see. We'll see. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, sincere and uh, honest uh, conversation uh, for our channel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, and I'll remind that uh, it was our guest, Kaimo 
Kursk, the Estonian ambassador to Ukraine. And as for now, I say goodbye to you. And I'm Ksenia Smirnova, and it was my show. Talk for more details. If you liked the episode, press like button. If you didn't like it, write in the comments why. And press the bell to be the first to see the most up-to-date information. And don't forget to subscribe to the Gaze platform on YouTube and on our different social networks. So keep in touch.